Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so joyful to see familiar faces, new faces. And um, welcome to those who are online. Welcome to those who are going to come later. I want to say that uh, today, several people who were in the previous workshop have been emailing me saying, we can't make it to the second workshop. This is going to be recorded. Where can we have access to this? So for those who may be uh, online, just know that, yes, we are recording this. And for mm -hmm. those who have emailed me and want the recording for this um, workshop, you will have it. All of you, if you wanted to, just email me and, and you'll have the recording. And the people who wanted to come here and couldn't make it today because they're traveling or something else, they'll have the recording too. For some of you who may not know me, my name is Alejandra Siroca. I'm a transformative communication teacher and coach. And I have devoted my life to the study, the exploration of language and communication as a transformative tool for as a tool of consciousness and as a tool of of change and evolution and what we are doing here is and what we'll be doing through these series is very different than just effective communication where you get a technique and if situation a happens you use these words and hopefully it goes the way you'd like it to go we are going to work here on communication at three different levels, as an awareness practice, as a form of awakening at an interrelational uh, level, and also as a form of evolutionary activism. How do we evolve through the use of this very powerful tool that we have available to us at all times, which is our language and how we use it in communication? as spiritual practitioners, as meditators, as people who are interested in growth and who are interested in bringing more compassion, more equity, more equality, more love, more harmony into our world, into our communities, into our families, into our hearts, we need to be aware of things that may fall <laughs> and gravity and physics and we also need to be aware of our communication. Whoops. So yeah, it seems like, ah, there's a way to hook it. OK. And why do we need to be aware of our communication? And that's part of what we're going to be exploring today. And I know like all eyes are on the poster. So how about we contemplate the poster right now? And we try to read some of those words. Uh, we agree to cultivate openness and curiosity, openness to different styles of communication, curiosity about how we are communicating with ourselves, and curiosity and openness to see the impact of how we're showing up in the world and in our relationships. Compassionate understanding to, under to have this idea that most of us, most of the time, communicate habitually. And when we communicate habitually and we don't know how we're communicating, then many times we are creating unnecessary pain for ourselves, for others, for the world. We may be perpetuating systems of oppression. We may be perpetuating systems of intolerance because we are not knowing how we are communicating. So having the compassionate understanding to see that we too may be communicating in ways that are perpetuating pain for ourselves and others. Then we have their authority. And I love saying that the etymology of the word authority is related to the word author. When you, uh, I, I would love for you to understand that the language you use Okay, let's see, do we have it? Not yet. Uh, okay, we may need a different system for October. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so authority is to be able to communicate in a way that reflects you are the authors of your own life. We're not just repeating 
how we were taught to communicate. Bravery is to have the, uh, the quality of being with discomfort and communicating anyway, trying to learn something that might be, that might seem hard, do it anyway. Have the bravery to say, you know, what I'm hearing right now feels really triggering in my body. Why? Because when we share that pain with others, if we are all cultivating openness and curiosity, now we can have a deeper conversation. Now we can have a meaningful relationship. Now we can have intimacy instead of brushing it off. But that requires bravery. And then the humility of being human, of understanding that sometimes what we say is going to create an impact that doesn't go along with the intention we had. Maybe we intended to be kind, maybe we intended to be funny, but the impact it had created pain, created trigger. That understanding that and being able to listen to someone telling us that requires humility and it also requires maturity. So I usually like to say, do not be afraid of hurting others, be confident. Because when we are communicating with other human beings, we are going to say things that is going to elicit hurt in the other. So what do we do with that? Well, then we have the opportunity to open up, to listen to the impact of our words, to the pain that others are having, and we have the opportunity not only to repair our connection, but to go even deeper in our relationship. That's the kind of world I have a vision of, not one in which, like we're living now, where there's divisiveness. I just got an email. I wish I would you know, have my phone here to read my email to you. I just got an email from a client who said, I need sessions with you because uh, my brother is now voting for Trump and I do not want to lose the relationship with my brother. I love him too much and I don't know how to talk about this. That requires all of this, bravery, humility, maturity, a lot of listening and authenticity, the ability to say what's here for you, regardless of how it might be heard because if the other person is having maturity and humility and bravery, they're gonna tell you, oh, I didn't like that. Or when I heard you say that, I just had a knot in my stomach. The other invitation for us in this space is to cultivate a sense of respect, a sense that everybody's language, culture, and way of communicating is useful, valuable. You know, they're here, they've survived, we've all survived. I usually say, I don't know how to talk to dead people. So you're all here, you're alive, you've made it. Let's respect one, one another for our different ways of communicating. And then we can move forward from there, we can learn together. The willingness to explore many times, especially maybe today, we're gonna get into some exercises that may lead to some discomfort that, you know, last time we worked on some other things and it was more looking in our previous workshop, looking at a big picture. Now we're gonna start getting inside of our communication system. Having transparency, uh, belonging and warmth. You know, I am, um, a proponent that even though I'm here, even though this is my area of passion, exploration, devotion, and you could call it expertise, we're all communicators. And I am a student first and foremost of language and communication. If we create a sense of belonging and warmth, then the safe space naturally emerges but one more thing emerges, which is our collective wisdom. And then uh, a sense of equality. Again, everybody's communication style is equally valuable, important, and contributes to the beautiful diversity of what's possible with language and communication. Confidentiality, if you leave here and wanna share something about this workshop, share what you've learned. 
share your experience rather than sharing, oh, you know, there was this person named so and so, I can't believe they said that. Rather than, rather share something like, I heard this comment in this workshop and I realized that when I heard it, my whole heart wanted to explode and I felt so much love. That is something that we can share, our experience. And then once again, diversity. I like saying most of us at a, an abstract conceptual level, we embrace diversity. We understand that in nature for all the different species and beings to survive, they need one another and they're different. But somehow with us, when something is not going well, we want the other person to be like us. We want the other person to say something the way we would say it. And when we're doing that, we're rejecting that diversity. Instead of saying, oh, okay, they're saying it in a way that um, is really uncomfortable for me. This is an opportunity for me to work with discomfort. This is an opportunity for me to create connection and intimacy with the other person if that's what I want, if that's useful, if that's kind, if that's timely. So that's what we're going to do today. Before we go into a meditation, because we want to create this space in that it's a communicative space, it's not just me, you know, talking and you uh, listening for two hours. I would like to start today by having you go into um, a mini dialogue with someone and you can choose anybody and it's going to be very simple all you're going to do is say your name um, my name is alejandra the pronouns i go by are she her ella in spanish or ella if i'm using argentinian um, accent and um and then choose one of the of these values that I call agreements to cultivate, choose one and say something about how you would like to cultivate it in these two hours. What's something that called your attention about them that you would like to bring forth in these two hours? So maybe um, you want to cultivate creating belonging and warmth and Maybe you have been realizing, especially after after our first workshop, that you're hot headed and you have to insert your, your opinion no matter what. Or um, maybe you want to create authority. And in the previous workshop, you realized that what's easy for you to communicate is going along with what everybody says at all times, and then you lose your sense of self. So just choose one choose a person to say hello to this is going to be like maybe two minutes per person i will let you know when to switch so you say your name your pronouns the pronouns you go by and then you say something from this list one of the values that you're willing to cultivate in these two hours okay any questions about what we're doing no Okay, and people online, so Tia, you're moderating, can you? Okay, great.
Jen, do you want to come to breakout room one with me? That's squeaky. Do we need more time or? Laura, Kathy, do you need more time? Kathy and Lauren or Laura? Laura, do you need more time? You're done? Okay, Jimmy and Augusta, do you need more time? Were you? Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to ask you, how, how was it to, um, to talk about that, something you would like to cultivate specifically in your communication in these two hours. How was it? Was it hard? Was it easy? Yeah, Jess. I found it hard to choose just one thing. I think all of them are things that I could work on or what you said about each one really resonated with me. But mm. I do like being able to pick something as the focus because it can seem overwhelming when there's so many things. And exactly. Like, you say how wonderful all these things are, and it's like I would love to embody them, all of them, every time I communicate. But to be able to pick one thing to focus on, I think, is very helpful. Beautiful. Yes. And you are bringing up something important, which is when we want to have an interaction with other, with an, with another person, and we want that interaction to go well. To and what does well mean? Right. It may be to feel connected, to um, to repair our connection, to have understanding, to have clarity, to be confident and say something. If we could pick just one, one intention, one value that we want to bring forward in that communication, then we're more likely to get there and to have that experience that we want. So sometimes I know that I need to communicate with someone and what I want is just to bring a sense of love and equality. That's all I'm focusing on. Rather than thinking, this is what I wanna say and then I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna say that. Just anchoring myself in that. And then it's like that is the vehicle that rides the whole conversation. So picking one, that's why I said just pick one and you notice the difference of one versus 
all of them that are wonderful. Wouldn't we want to always communicate with kindness and clarity and confidence and compassion and love and eloquence? Oh, you know, exhausting. So let's just pick one that is important. Anybody else wants to say anything else about how this was? People online or? Yes, Arana. Oh, to repeat, yes, thank you, thank you. So Jess had said that while all these words that we talked about here, all these values are wonderful values to cultivate and she really related to each of them as I was mentioning them, just focusing on one uh, was easier and well, easier, did you say easier? No, you didn't say easier. More helpful, More helpful. Less, overwhelming. less overwhelming, thank you. Yes, did that capture what you said? Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Definitely notice how interconnected they all are. You know, we're talking about if I want to be a oh, oh, thank you. Is it on? Check Let's see. Two. Yeah, it doesn't amplify in the room, it just lets the folks on the Oh, okay, good. We're good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I noticed how interconnected they all are. If I want to be able to be open, I have to have a sense of bravery in order to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I picked was bravery. And I just noticed how nervous I felt almost like when I was just thinking it in my head, like, oh, I got to be brave, got to be brave. And then when I said it out loud and I acknowledged it, I, I already kind of felt more brave. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Is that weird? But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was just kind of nice saying like, oh, I can already do it because I'm just acknowledging my intention and what I want to be able to cultivate in a way I felt like already starting to cultivate it. Yes. And you know what, what you're doing is in again, you know, this is how the collective wisdom is emerging. Because what you're bringing up is the importance of saying things out loud. Today, as we work with our internal dialogue, we're going to see how insidious and sometimes harmful it is to just keep things to ourselves and saying certain things to ourselves rather than saying them out loud, hearing our voice saying them. And then if they were like big, they don't have to be big scary monsters because we said them out, we named them, we heard our voice. Actually, we could say that. Or sometimes we get to see how silly these thoughts are, how, um, ridiculous they are, how untrue, how unhelpful they are. When we say things out loud, we are in a brave space with ourselves. So thank you. Anybody else online or here? So I would love to, popcorn style, I would love every person just to say the word that you pick, just to put it in the space. So just one, just say the one word you pick. Authenticity. Authenticity. Listening. Listening. Belonging, belonging and warmth. Willingness to explore. Bravery. Bravery. Diversity. Diversity. Openness and curiosity. Openness and Humility and maturity. Humility and maturity. How about online? You can unmute yourselves and say the word that you worked with. Authenticity. Authenticity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, now that we know what we would like to cultivate, let's just take a moment to go inside so that we can get more deeply connected. And as we do all these housekeeping things, so let's just take a moment to go within. We're going to do a self-connection, AKA meditation. It's okay that all these movements and noises are around us. Notice what it's like to be in your body with the noises. With the space around us. Notice what it's like to be you right here, right now. In this beautiful space, a collective 
ran by volunteers who are giving their love, their energy, their resources, their capacities and skills for the compassionate liberation of all beings, the S of Dharma Collective. Notice what it's like to be here in this space together, that for all of us who are here in person is in the unceded ancestral land of the Rametush Ohlone people. Notice what it's like to be here in this space together with others who are motivated to learn transformative communication tools to relate more consciously. What is it like to be in the company of people here and online? And now take a moment to notice what is it like to be in your body in this moment? Does your body need anything? Listen, receive, notice. If your body needs a different posture, give it to your body. Listen to that wisdom of the body. Now take a moment to notice what keeps you alive in your body, your breath. Notice your breath. Listen to your breath. Receive your breath. Feel your breath. Notice the inhale. Notice the exhale. Listen to the inhale. Listen to the exhale. Notice and receive the inhale. Receive the exhale. Feel the inhale. Feel the exhale. And do this a few times. Noticing, listening, receiving. And feeling. Now bring that word again that you shared out loud with someone, whether it was discovery and exploration, bravery, humility, maturity, listening. And notice that word again. Receive that word. Feel that word. And once again, connect to the intention to cultivate that word or those words, those values for the rest of our time together.
Thank you. So let's just notice that we just connected to ourselves for just like 10 minutes. I think that's what we did. What do you notice in your body right now? What's the sensation of being here right now? More settled. Thank you. Relaxed. Anybody else? Okay, so we mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention this every single time. When we are doing even like a few minutes of a meditation practice, which is simply going within and connecting with ourselves, we have more availability to connect with others. The more connected we are to ourselves, the more available we are to show up in the world with all these beautiful values that we want to cultivate together. The more disconnected we are from ourselves, the harder it is to connect with others in meaningful ways, because we connect with others in habitual ways. So let's start with today's topic. So we last workshop, for those of you who were or were not here, we talked about how language is one of the most powerful tools we have available to relate to others and how and to ourselves and create our relationship with reality, with ourselves, the world, others, and how that language was learned. Remember, we said it takes about seven years to get the download of that language. And because of how and what we have been taught to communicate now as adults, some things are easy to communicate, some things are hard to communicate. And we talked about how for different people, for some people, it's easy to be vulnerable and communicate about vulnerable things. For some others, it's hard to be vulnerable and communicate vulnerable things. For some people, it's easy to express gratitude. For some others, it's hard to express gratitude. For some people, it's easy to talk about themselves. For others, it's hard to talk about themselves. For some people, it's easy to vent. For others, it's really hard to vent, and they only talk about what's good and what's going well. And, you know, we could go on and on and on, but what we saw in last workshop was that what's easy or hard for us to communicate is related to what we were taught to communicate, what we've seen modeled in communication that made it sort of like familiar. It's the way people are communicating. It's what's happening. So we learned that. And because we replicated that when we were children, then it became easy or it became hard when we were not exposed to talking about our feelings, expressing gratitude, or asking questions and being open to others, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to ask you first to notice, and you know, I remember uh, one of you here, it was Jimmy, you were really happy last week when, or last week, last workshop, when we weren't just noticing what was easy for us to communicate, but also when you're like, are we going to work on what's hard for us to communicate? Yes. So let's notice again one thing that's easy for you to communicate. So just, just notice this for a moment. We're going to work on the hard thing today. But let's, let's look at one thing that's, hard, that's easy for you to communicate. Can we put it in the space? So um, for me, because this is what I've learned, it's very easy to, to make compliments, you know, to make compliments out loud. Very easy. How about for others? What's easy for you to communicate? Curiosity about the other. Curiosity about the other. So ask questions. Asking questions about the other is easy, OK? What else is easy for you to communicate? 
frustrations. Yes, thank you. things in common with others, mm -hmm. to find that common denominator. Mm -hmm. planning. planning. Talking about planning. Yes. Also planning. Also planning. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. T, I I think, raised her hand or not? Yeah, I can, I can read it. Uh, appreciation for others. Appreciation for others. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Asking, questions. Asking questions. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Serena? Saying sorry. Saying I'm sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now notice that when you are communicating that, it is habitual communication. So when you are showing up with others and you're only talking about what you have in common, asking questions, or immediately saying I'm sorry, or expressing frustrations, or ex noticing what I can compliment about you. All these things are, or uh, expressing appreciation, all these things, planning, they are familiar, they're easy because we've done it again and again and again, and they're habitual. That is not always our authentic expression. If that's the go-to place for us, it's not authentic. We're just replicating, repeating something that usually keeps us at a surface level. Because authentic communication, which requires bravery, goes much deeper. So when it is familiar, it is repeated, how does it feel in the body? How does it feel when we're asking other questions, or when we're communicating frustrations, when we are asking questions of others, appreciating others, plan, talking about planning, talking about um, you know, saying I'm sorry right away, or uh, finding the common denominator of something to talk about? How does it feel in the body? Light? No tension anywhere, right? Thank you. Anybody else? Notice how to... Easy. It feels easy inside, right? Oh. Smooth and fluent. Fluid or fluent? Both. Fluid and fluent. Okay. Mm -hmm. It feels open. Yeah. Open. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? So we could say it feels comfortable, easy, light, open, fluid, fluent. We are in our comfort zone. So imagine for a moment, everybody's in a hammock, you know, like we have hammocks here and we're all in a hammock. You know, when we're communicating that way, we're like that, relaxed, light. It's easy, it's our comfort zone. We're enjoying things, we're not, necessarily learning things. Now let's imagine what does it feel like in the body when you need to communicate something that's hard for you to communicate. So let's bring up some things first that are hard for us to communicate. Frustration. Frustration. Mm -hmm. For me, it, sadness was really hard to communicate sadness. Apologies, mm -hmm. disagreement, disagreement. Uh, anger, anger. Confrontation. confrontation, sadness, sadness. disappointment, disappointment. Mm -hmm. insecurities, insecurities. Mm -hmm. saying no. Saying no. Yeah. Anybody online? What's hard for you to communicate? 
I, uh, so many of the ones that have been mentioned uh, resonate and and it's um, even more challenging when they feel really big. Right. Okay. Like big anger or big insecurity or big anger, big insecurity when they feel big. Yeah. So hard. Okay. So now let's just notice for a moment. I love everybody to imagine that that place that is hard for you to communicate, that we can say that zone of discomfort is what we're going to call today your stretch zone. It's the place which you have not been taught how to communicate about that. You have not been taught how to communicate sadness or insecurities or um, or saying no or apologizing. You didn't get the proper teaching, the proper training. So you just don't know how to do it. And to have that sense of humility and understanding that, wow, I'm an adult, but I really don't know how to communicate about this. And to, to have the maturity to say, and I want to stretch what I am able to communicate, and I want to learn how to include that. So rather than thinking of how uncomfortable it is, I want to invite you all to think about how if you learn how to communicate what's hard for you, you are stretching, you're including one more thing that you can learn how to communicate as you with authority, with authenticity, with clarity, with compassion, with awareness. And so we're going to do a little exercise and it's going to be a writing exercise. If you do not have something to write on, please get some um, some paper. There's some paper here, some pens. Does anybody need anything? Pens? Do we have some pens somewhere? You have an extra. There are a great number of pens in the office. Okay. So first of all, yes, and there are clipboards there if you want, um, you know, something hard to write on. Okay. So first of all, write down my stretch zone. And below that, write something that's hard for you to communicate. This is just for you. You don't have to share it out loud. Something that feels hard for you to communicate. And now notice, what does it feel like in your body when you need when you are in a situation when you need to communicate that what is it like in your body when you need to say no when you need to express your sadness when it would be important to apologize useful to share some insecurities it's very, uncomfortable. very uncomfortable okay write it down and let's map map it down like uncomfortable how where does it feel uncomfortable is it uncomfortable to get a lump in your throat do your hands get clammy sweaty is your heart beating fast do you feel so tiny that you want to disappear from the earth does it get hot inside
Do you start shaking inside? Is there an inner shakiness? Do you feel like you're going to fall, that you're going to sort of like uh, lose balance or dissolve, that your body is going to dissolve? Do you leave your body? So let's just notice what is it like in your body and just write it down. Map it out. Does it feel contracted, constricted, cold? Do you get nauseous? Do you get butterflies in your stomach, but not the good kind of butterflies? So does everybody have something? This is for you. You're not going to share this out loud, but just would love for you to like notice for yourself. Do you have something? Yeah. Okay. Now let's go to the second question. Very important question. What do you say to yourself when you have those body sensations? What do you say to yourself? Do you say to yourself, oh, this is so hard. This is unfair. I can't do this. The other person is going to kill me. I'm going to be in trouble. I will never be able to do this. This will never change. The other is an idiot. I'm an idiot. If I do this, I'll be punished. I'm going to lose the relationship. The other one's not going to like me. I'm going to be rejected. I'm not going to be loved. I'm so stupid. The other is going to think I'm not smart. I'm, I'm dumb. This is not going to go well. to ruin everything. It's going to ruin the other person's life, day, party, event. And so I want to ask you the third question. Do we have some, did we write some things down? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to ask you the third question, which is, so what do you do when you feel what you feel in your body? And when you tell yourself what you tell yourself, what do you end up doing? So some people may say, I just don't talk about it. I change the subject. I get distracted. I talk about something else. I ask questions for the other. I hide. 
I fight. I tell them like it is. I sweep it under the rug. I pretend everything is okay. I smile. I say yes. I do what the other person says, even though that's not what I want. I keep myself small. I make the other a problem. I um, criticize them. I put it on the other person, put it on them. I deny it, defend myself, get defensive, act offended. I ghost the other person. Don't communicate with them. <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> Is that resonating? <laughs> I hear some laughter in the room. <laughs> Okay, and some smiles and laughter, yeah, okay. So you have now like outed yourself. How is it to see this when something's hard? This is what you feel in your body. Because of what you feel in your body, this is what you tell yourself. And then what you tell yourself leads you to do something that I'm imagining is not very helpful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I see some nods. So what is it like to see this about yourself, to acknowledge, okay, this is what we do. I'll give an example. I used to have a really hard time communicating sadness. I was never sad, never like that, never existed. I was a happy-go-lucky kid who needed to be that way for my family. There was a lot of sadness when I was born, so I was gonna be like the, the joy of the family, make everybody laugh and feel good about themselves. Never sad. And so whenever I was sad, I would either go into like, uh, I would feel depressed because I didn't know like what sadness was. And then I was scared that I was feeling that. I would not hide, I would hide it. I would not communicate it or, um, or what I would do is just talk about happy things because, you know, good vibes only. And uh, we should all be happy all the time because that's what life should be about, right? And, uh, and so it wasn't until probably I was like 33, 35, I don't know, that a friend said, you have a real problem with sadness, right? You... Um, you don't like being with people who are sad. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's, that's not me. And she's like, well, I was, I shared something sad with you the other day. And then you gave me a gift and you told me, oh, because you're so this and you're so that. And that's when I started understanding, oh yeah, I, I have no clue what sadness is. I have no clue how to be with sadness. I have no clue that it's actually a regular human feeling, like any other feeling, that it doesn't have to go into deep, scary, dark depression, that it's just sadness and that I can learn how to talk about it. So then I had to do a lot of work and it took me years to learn to be able to say, you know, yeah, in this moment, something's happen and happening and my heart is broken. And many of you who get my newsletters and Many of you are here who get my newsletters. You, you, you hear me talk about sadness. Uh, it's not, you know, it's a friend like any other feeling. I've learned to do that. You can learn. It's, I include it in my stretch zone. And now it's okay. So how is it for you to see what's hard for you to communicate? 
how it feels in your body, what you tell yourself. You know, I used to tell myself, nobody's going to love a sad girl. Nobody's going to la love a sad person. Nobody's going to love a sad woman. So I can't be sad. I just have to be happy all the time. Not true. That's not life. First noble truth, there's pain in life. So, um, so how is it for you to see yourselves? I'd like to have the bravery and the maturity and the willingness to explore, um, to share. Yeah. Realizing how often I say them, and I think it was just nice when you write it down that you see the process of how it all plays out. Yeah, it was nice to. It was easy to see all the thing negative things you say to yourself, and it was nice to write it down and see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. And now that you put it out on the page, what is it like for you to be able to see it? Once I wrote it down, it had a similar feeling to when I said it out loud before about being brave. It's like when I wrote it, it was out there and it wasn't such a scary thought just circling around in my head. It was like, yeah, I do feel that way. And mm -hmm. this is tricky and it does bring up these feelings. And also I recognize, you know, when I feel this way, I behave in a way that I don't want to. Ah. <laughs> I don't want to behave in that way. And I would feel hurt if someone else behaved in that way to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How many of you can relate to that, that what you end up doing is not what you would want to be doing? How many of you can relate to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. How many of you would not want others to relate to you that way in the way that you end up, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now let's look at something else. The things that you say to yourself. So we're going to go back to what you say to yourself. Who does it agree with? Does it agree with how um, you were raised? Does it agree with some level of culture that dictated what your identity should be like, who you should be? Does it agree with um, society, the different rules of society that we have? So who do these thoughts that you have about yourself when you feel uncomfortable because you don't know, because something is hard for you to communicate, who does that agree with? So I'll tell you, in my case, it agreed with first my mom. We don't want sad people here. You can, you're not allowed to be sad. You know, you have so much in your life. You should always be grateful. Uh, look at all the efforts that you and uh, that I and your father have made for you to have this life. So there are so many people in the world who are have it so much worse than you. You should not be sad. So agrees with her. It also agree, agrees with being raised in Argentina in a Latino culture where as a woman, I needed to be strong and happy so that I could be raised to find a mate who would love me and protect me. And that then I would become a valuable member of society if I was raised as a uh, a female who was also happy and making everybody else happy, then I could be loved. So all these layers of culture and upbringing are agreeing with what was going on in my head. I can't be sad. I can't show you my sadness. There's no place for me. That's wrong. So how about you? What did you discover? Who does it agree with? 
Yes, Augusta. A lot of pride in the family and to not ask questions because it meant you didn't know which meant you were stupid uh -huh. and so you, you the, the idea of asking for help or asking questions was uh, is a really hard thing to do right and I see it in my siblings mm hmm yeah yeah thank you so it's the it's the culture of the family that you were raised in that didn't not only didn't teach you how to ask questions, ask for help, but it also taught you this belief that that was wrong, that then you didn't know and not knowing was unacceptable within that cultural rule. Cultural is a set of rules of what's allowed, what's not allowed, what's good, what's not good, what's right, what's not right. So. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Jess? I think a lot of like the thoughts that I've had sort of agree with um, things I've been told by partners in relationships. And the thing that I struggle communicating is apologizing because in my head I feel like if I apologize it's admitting that they are correct in uh -huh. their assumption about me or what they said about me which doesn't align with my image of myself mm -hmm. um, and so like the thoughts that I would tell myself um, about those that communication struggle sort of aligns with their critiques of me and the things that I don't want to believe are true or I don't think they're right. Yes. That about me. Yes. And who does it agree with that receiving a critique or others telling you who you are is wrong, inaccurate, bad, can't listen to that. There's no room for that. Who does that agree with or what does it agree with? Well, I think for me, I sort of grew up in this like household where perfectionism was very valued mm. and, and at school as well and just like where I'm from and so yeah. um, sort of like the ideals that I would hold myself to um, there there wasn't really room to admit oh I did do something wrong or right. I am this or I am that and I hurt somebody or I need to apologize um, because there's this idea that you shouldn't be hurting people you you know like you should be holding yourself to this standard in a right. way. Um, and then somehow, if you are a flawed human, it's it somehow detracts from your worth. Yes. So let's just acknowledge something with both of you. What you both learned and what you say to yourself doesn't align with you. It aligns with what you have learned, what you have been taught with somebody else. It agrees with somebody else. It agrees again with this cultural layer of your family of perfectionism and so admitting any fault no we do not go there that's not seen as good okay thank you this is so rich and this is so important if everybody could say something it's really like we're doing here we're liberating ourselves from what we believe is our internal dialogue and our authentic communication, which is not. That's what I want to show you today. Most of the things we say in our internal dialogue when we're having a hard time is what we have learned, what we have uh, it ingrained. It's ingrained from those seven years of life. But our internal dialogue is the greatest influencer we have in our lives. It's what dictates what we do, how we live. It dictate, dictates what decisions we make, who we hang out with, what kind of day we have, what kind of life we have, what kind of relationships we have. So we're letting ourselves be influenced now by something that is not us. It was external. We have internalized it. So let's keep liberating these stories. Who else wants to share? Yes, Laura, can someone give her the mic? Thanks, Jimmy. Um, mine is uh, around uh, avoiding conflict. And my voice is 
probably the situation when I was very young um, from my, my parents and caregivers, because we went, all went through a very difficult time. And the message was, if you complain, you're burdening someone, oh. and then you make them angry. And then now that they're angry, it's your fault. Oh. And so it was always redirected. It's like, and then this is your fault. I'm angry, you're upset, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. So you better just go figure it out on your own. Oh, yes. And so what you say to yourself, again, agrees with not you and your capacity, but with what someone else believes system that if you bring something up that then they feel angry about, then it's your fault, then you should figure it out. Therefore, better not to say anything and avoid conflict at all cost because it's going to end up being your fault. That's the thought. That's not yours. It's not yours. It's not yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Who else? Who's next? Yeah, Jesse. Um, I think for me, a lot of what I noticed was um, just messages that have been told to women in uh -huh. general, like, you know, you're too emotional, you're too crazy, you're overreacting, you're too much. Um, so I've noticed a lot of that. And also um, in regards to being a disabled woman, I feel like there's a lot of like stigmas around disability and people will either view me in a way like they give me pity mm -hmm. or they feel bad for me or feel like I'm incapable of doing things or there's like the um the idea that oh if you have a disability then you're inspiring you're automatically right. an inspiration yes and it's like there's nothing inspiring about just having something different about you I think what you use make can make you inspirational if you're overcoming a challenge in life regardless of what it is but i notice for me that if i'm going to go out and about and i don't feel so secure in myself or whatever story i'm telling myself i'm concerned that i'm not going to be this conf like i have to be this like overly confident and overly inspirational and just have it all together person just to like be at the same level as people who aren't disabled so I notice a lot of that. So much pressure. Messages. Yeah, it really is. Ugh, I just, it, it sounds so exhausting. And both to have to be within this, you know, spectrum of either like the pity and, um, and also the, the other one, like, well, you are so inspiring and you have to be inspiring at all times. Plus, all these messages of women should be this, women should be that. So how is it for you right now to see that these things that you say to yourself are not yours? It definitely feels good. I feel like I have a lot of, I mean, I'm sure as we all do, a lot of internal messages. Um, and so just to acknowledge them puts them outside of myself and I can kind of decide do I want to feel that way? Do I right. pity myself? Like, do I always feel confident or inspiring? And if I don't, does that make me less than or, you know, incapable? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's nice to acknowledge it and put it outside of myself and figure out if I want to feel that way about myself mm -hmm. and how I feel about me also will dictate or maybe play a role in how others are going to feel about me and, and interpret me and my experience. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's not yours. Who else wants to liberate their story and, you know, claim it as not yours? Who's next? Vicky. So my, when I was growing up, my mom, is chronically ill mm -hmm. and also loves us very much and is very generous and so sometimes would go beyond her physical capacity in order to show up to our activities or to mm. take us or to spend time with which i understand now as a parent but right. as a 
I think it's hard for me now to express disappointment or to express wanting any particular thing to happen because plans would be canceled just all the time. Right. Because I couldn't want too much from her because then she'd hurt herself mm. trying to give that to me. Or if she'd cancel it, if I had been too attached to something I was hoping we would do and then it would just be canceled, that was really painful. So I just learned to like, just like, well, that's not happening. Moving on. Like, mm -hmm. And I didn't, and not to get too excited about anything. Right. And so um, what you say to yourself is, I cannot get too excited about anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to be like, just like roll with whatever comes up. Yeah. And in this case, what you are, what you're bringing up, it comes from a skill that you had to learn or a strategy that you had to learn at a young age. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so we would, we could say, it's not yours now, in the sense that it was yours then sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you did what, I'm sorry to break it to you, you're human, <laughs> just like me, just like all of us. So you did what every human brain does, which when we are children, which is what we have this experience again and again and again, we solidify it as an always. It is always this way. And so now your stretch zone is to consider sometimes it is this way, not always. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Okay, who wants the mic next? Brandon is going to go for it. I don't particularly like this exercise. I yeah. That. Yeah, uh, who loves this exercise? Um, <laughs> yeah, so you'll feel good after. I think I, think it, I, can, I, I believe that it is useful, but my brain is like, 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 uh, it's just minimizing the right. like limitation or what feels uncomfortable to express. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You know what you're exercising right now? Transparency. <laughs> <laughs> I that really. Was, that was my second. Uh, I, my I second appreciate part. that. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't. It's I don't. Wouldn't say that it rises to like shame, but I, I particularly don't like mine. Um, and also, it's like, yeah, this is just hard. Yeah. And it's like, not hard every time, but it's like, hard some of the time. And that causes problems. Um, the, what was the prompt? Uh, what do you say to yourself when that happens? Who does that agree with? Well, it agrees with other people's needs and that they be well. Like, the, you know, if they feel good, then I can feel good kind of uh. a thing. It's very like codependent or annoying as hell but yeah that is the truth of it is like oh they're uncomfortable i should like yeah. stop that but mm. really i'm uncomfortable you wow know, in that situation so so um, not everybody but like yeah yeah like or you know people around me that i care about I yeah so brandon it it agrees with uh this idea that it's your responsibility to make people feel good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big responsibility. It's, yeah, it's not a good thing to set out to do all the time. Um, <sighs> yeah, and it, well, yeah, it is not, um, yeah, it causes some problems. Yeah, and so this, this idea that it's your responsibility to make people feel good, who does that agree with? I mean, I put everyone else, but I mean, it's not everybody else. But yeah, I mean, most of the time it is other people. Other people. It agrees with other people. So everybody around you tells you, you should make me feel good, Brandon. And if I feel uncomfortable, it's your fault. I mean, I th yeah, I think like because people have mentioned sort of like childhood stuff, like, yeah, having like a mom who's depressed, you know, all the time, then yeah, you want to like, whatever, like, 
it feels yeah. bad to like be connected to that person and yeah you know the idea that you could like make them feel better is a reasonable thing to come up with as a kid mm -hmm. um and some of the times you do you know like you can momentarily so right uh but yeah it is like being like open about it and thinking about it it's just like this, this feels so per, like pervasive. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it's just like, wow, it, it's such a, you know, it agrees with the past experience, you know, like with Vicky, it's a st strategy that you developed. Welcome to the human family. You're a human, you're not AI, you're <laughs> you know. How wonderful. And I want to ask you, do you really have the power to dictate how other people are going to feel? Well, no, and it's also kind of inauthentic. Like, it's not like, it doesn't really align with, like, yeah, like, if I'm them in that situation, like, I don't want the Brendan to do, I mean, I don't want that other, another person to do that, you know, for mm -hmm. reasons. Like, yeah. It's not like, yeah, that's not equal, it's not community, it's not. Oh, is it never going to go away? I mean, I, yeah. That's just what's going on. Right? Yes. I know things can change. Yeah. If you think about yourself like 10 years ago, are you exactly the same, Brandon? No. In every way? No. No. What if I were to tell you that you have no power to dictate how others are going to feel? Yes, it's really strong. Um, I mean, I yeah, I don't. I'm not particularly open to that right now. But um, <laughs> thank you. Yes, but, thank you. But uh, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I love it. You know, and I see from your body language. Yeah, you're not open. Oh, I'm not I'm open not about. Open I'm, not, I'm also not upset. That you, like, no, no, I know. I get I'm it. Like, oh, I. How dare she? It's just like. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I love that you said that is strong. That is a strong <laughs> statement. Yeah. Because always never, you know, those are strong statements that are actually inaccurate. What if I were to tell you that you don't have a lot of power or that you have a little power in how others are going to feel because how others are going to feel depends on them. It's internal. Sometimes you'll come with the best of intentions and other people are going to feel hurt. They're going to feel pissed. They're going to feel angry, uncomfortable, fill in the blanks. I came today with the best of intentions and some of you may be feeling angry, like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. I, yeah, I agree. I would go, I would go farther. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think limited and intention is important and also like yeah you can't like do that much yeah but you can't you know, do like, that much you know you care about somebody you can feel connected and you also can't like yeah drive their bus mm -hmm. so sometimes you know I, I i give some people this example let's say that you um you want to give someone a gift so you give them a bottle of wine and the recipient of the bottle of wine, and maybe some of you have heard this example, but the recipient of the, of the bottle of wine goes like, wow, you gave me a bottle of wine. Like, that's super exciting. Thank you. Does it mean that you want to get together with me and, you know, have this bottle of wine together? This is great. Person number two has been sober for 30 years. So then they go like, horror, you're giving me a bottle of wine? This is so disrespectful. You're not supporting me and my life and my choices. Like, who are you? Third person, I don't have anything to give you back. You're giving me a bottle of wine and uh, um, does it mean I need to give you something in return? 
fourth person, why are you giving me a gift? Are you going to ask me for a big favor later on? I cannot trust this. Fifth person, big sommelier somewhere. You're giving me this cheap bottle of wine? Is this a joke? So we did the same thing. We gave the same thing. How the other person, the recipient, is going to react or respond is based on all these layers of cultures, the way they've learned to communicate and feel, and feel their own reactions. And that's what we need to understand, that sometimes we're going to come with the best intentions, be confident of hurting others, saying something that's uncomfortable, uh, eliciting pain, frustration, disappointment. Then, if we're open, we get to communicate around that rather than feel the burden of, I am making you feel this way, I should make you feel this other way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, I like that. You like that? Well, there's like seven or a hundred responses that you don't know. Depending on who it is, right? Or the day or, yeah. or, the day or what happened to them, you know, whether they are hangry whether they ate that day or they didn't eat that day yeah there's going to be one person who says thank you that's great i love wine <laughs> one person is going to say thank you i love this is my favorite wine <laughs> exactly thank you so much this is so exciting i'm not sharing that with you this is all for myself <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes please so sometimes i feel like i understand that that people are going to respond however they're going to understand respond that makes sense but sometimes it makes me, knowing that makes me just fold up and get really quiet and shy because I'm afraid that no matter what I do, it's going to hurt somebody. It's like, how do you, it just makes, makes you want to like. Yes. So let's just notice what is happening here, that no matter what I do is going to hurt someone is an absolute statement. And when we have absolute statements, absolute statements tend to lead to pain because they are inaccurate. The truth is that sometimes we, these things may happen, sometimes these things may not happen. So to open that up with the power of language, we need to be able to say, so say that statement again. Um, no matter what I do, it's going to hurt somebody. No matter what I do, it's going to hurt someone. So now shift it to some things I may do may hurt someone. Some things I may do may not hurt someone. Can you say that out loud? Uh, some things I may do may hurt someone. Some things I may do may not hurt someone. So just notice what happens inside when you say that. I don't know, for right now, it just felt kind of mechanical. Like, I'll just say these words, and yeah. um, but I'll sit with it. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the idea here is that most of the things we say to ourselves in our internal dialogue are absolute statements. And these absolute statements always, never, in general, this is what will happen, this is what's going to happen. It is not accurate because life is never an absolute. Life is up and down. We have great days. We have shitty days. We have wonderful moments of connection. We have painful moments of disconnection. We have joy and excitement. We have boredom and despondency. All of it is part of the human experience. And what you are bringing up is connected to the, you know, I cannot be disappointed, so I'd rather like not do anything. And then the impact of that may be like, it's not allowing you to fully participate in your life. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. 
So it's, it's important here to notice that these things that we say to ourselves in our internal dialogue are usually phrased in terms of absolutes. Can you all look at what you wrote and see if there's an absolute statement? It will never be this way. It will always be this way. You are like this. You should be like this, meaning like all the time. Jimmy, you're saying yes. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, Jess, you're saying yes. Mm -hmm. Brandon, mm -hmm. I see Tia there saying yes. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so here's the thing. The, these statements of what we say to ourselves doesn't really agree with us. It's not an authentic expression of ourselves. It is something that we have inherited. We have heard many, many times from culture, from society, or based on a past experience as a child. And we have made them into these absolute, never changing, unchanging construction that then blocks our ability to stretch our zone of skillful communication and be able to communicate that. So what we say to ourselves is not authentic, it's repeated. We say to ourselves again and again, it's habitual. Whenever we are in, whenever we are in a habitual communication pattern, we're not being authentic, we're not being real, we're not being present, we're not being us the true us. So I want to open up first for questions, comments, objections, all welcome, anytime. Yeah. Questions? Yes, Tia has a question or opening up the... I, I had my hand up for the thing we were doing. Are we still doing that or is that shifted and... No, 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 no. Do, okay. do... Yes. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and I just want to notice that there's been a lot of back and forth without kind of checking in with Zoom. So, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah. So the, um, <laughs> I was writing all my journals and I'm like, okay, I've, I've like been working on this and I can totally see ways that I've been working on this and this and this. And then Vicky shared and like, I had a memory from my youth and living mm -hmm. with my parents and my whole body constricted. And I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, some of this is still really unconscious and I haven't like brought it all up. And the one that came up, uh, the one that, that, that Vicky Vicky Cher reminded me of was um, uh, uh, my parents were horrible at saying no to me. Like they always wanted to say yes to me. So they did. And then that means that they didn't do a lot of things that they said they were going to do. And oh. somewhere as I became a teenager, that became my job to not ask them for things they would have to say no for. And this mm. is really in particular with my dad. So there's alcoholism and then like managing that thing. It's freaking bananas. Um, yeah. And, I think I still do it with people um, because of how this feels, right? Like, like yeah. literally Vicky said that thing and I felt like I'd like turned over a rock and I was looking at like the damp and the bugs and the compost and the soil. And I'm like, okay, is the sun good or bad for this? Like really just um, rough and yeah. Uh, uh, you know, what's the story? I can't make you say no to me, right? Like, the hell is I that? cannot make you say no to me. That's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what we, what we could say is that that's not accurate. I, I, I've done a lot of work on like, okay, let's have authentic yeses and nos in my life. And then to kind of notice that there's this under. Yeah. Under one of the reasons there might be underlying resistance and all that. Yeah. Wow. Right. So how is it to um, acknowledge this and perhaps putting it in the stretch zone for you? Uh, uh, calming, like my, calming. my stomach's still tight, but my torso's relaxed. So it's shifting. So yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so I was thinking of doing an activity in pairs again. Do not worry, you will not have to share what, you know, your whole process of what you had to do. All we're going to share right now is when, and you don't even need to say what it is that's hard for you to the other person. All you're going to share right now is three questions that you're going to ask your partner. When, you know, the, I asked you three questions. First, it was, how does it feel in your body? What do you say to yourself? And what do you do when you feel this and you say this to yourself? You do something, right? Like I share, like with me, I would just deny my sadness and just be happy and say something happy. And so we're just going to work with that part, with what you do, that third answer that you gave. And the question you're going to ask your partner is, what is the impact on you when you do what you do? You don't even have to share what it is that you do. So what is the impact on you when you do what you do? So in my case, it would be, what's the impact on denying my sadness and being happy? That would be the, imp that's what, I don't even have to tell you, but you would ask me, what's the impact of doing what on yourself and doing what you do? Well, uh, I guess the impact is that I don't know how to communicate sadness. And the impact is that I am not real with people. And the impact is that I'm not real with myself. And the impact is that I deny anything that could possibly be sad for me. Um, you know, that could be the impact for me. The second question you're going to ask is, what could be the impact of what you do for the other person? What could be the impact for the other person? So I'm going to give you an example in a moment. So just write these questions. What's the impact on yourself when you do what you do? Secondly, what could be the impact for the other person? And you're going to ask a third question. What is the impact on the relationship with that person? So the third question is, what's the impact on the relationship with that person? So. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So Augusta, can you ask me the three questions? And I'm not even going to <clears throat> share what it is that I'm doing, but because I, you know what my example is, you'll, you'll see this. Let me drink some water first. Um, so what is the impact on you when you do what you do? Um, <clears throat> The impact on me when I do what I do is that I keep myself on the surface. I deny my sadness or whatever is sad that I'm experiencing. Um, and the impact is that I don't believe that there's room for my sadness in this world. And then um, what is the impact on the other person? Um, the impact on the other person is that, uh, well, they don't get to know the real me. And um, they don't, the, the impact also is that they may um, think that I'm, you know, that I'm fake, that I'm just happy all the time. Life is not happy all the time, but they may think I'm fake. Um, they may not want to um, be in a real friendship with me or only when it's time to have fun. Um, and what is the impact on the relationship with others? The impact of, uh, of what I do 
um, in, on the relationship with others is it keeps relationships at a surface level and um, um, it keeps lopsided relationships where I can listen to whatever's going on for the other person, but I cannot share what's going on for me. Okay. Do you understand? So what I did, you know, I worked on this for years so I can share all these things that were true. They're not true necessarily now because I have worked with expressing sadness, but this is what you don't need to sh even share. What is it that you do? You just answer those three questions. And the important thing here is to notice this is like a meditation out loud. You're connecting with yourself. You are hearing your voice. And when you do that, you're liberating this out of your system instead of keeping all this isolated in as an absolute true statement inside. Does that make sense? Questions before we start? Objections? And I say it in every workshop, you are a mature adult who's a choice. You can choose to pass. And if you choose to pass, notice, are you choosing to pass out of habit because you want to stay in that hammock, the comfort zone? Or are you choosing to pass because you believe that, well, if you go into, you cannot stretch, you know, you cannot put this in your stretch zone or that you're going to go into a panic zone and that would be too much. So check in with yourself. And after you check in with yourself, if you choose to do this exercise, go find a partner. And you're going to ask that partner the three questions. This is not dialogue, so don't say, wow, really, you do that? Or, so no judgments. Every time the other person answer the question, do the beautiful modeling that Augusta, Augusta shared here. She said, thank you. And then ask this, the second question. When the person's done, thank you. And then ask the third question. And then you switch. Okay? Shall we try it? Alejandra? Yes. Um, how long should I make... Um, how long should I give in the breakout rooms? I think, uh, you know, two minutes per person is... Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we turn that off? No, you just leave it there, I guess. Oh, that's good. All right. So find a partner.
If you finished, switch to the uh, second partner. You have one more minute. Thank you. I'd love to hear, um, you know, if someone on Zoom is willing to hear how this was for you, especially if it's someone who hasn't shared yet, I'd love that. I'd love to have you here in our space. I think you would need to unmute yourself, right? Or Tia, like what are the instructions here? Yes. Anne, are you up for it? Sure. Um, I, it was very interesting. I realized that I'm doing things that people aren't taking me seriously because my go-to is joking about everything. Hmm. So I, yeah, I can make a joke out of anything. And so of course people don't think I need things I ask for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. How was it for you to notice that? Um, interesting because my family jokes about everything yeah. and like, we make a sick joke about everything. So it's really going to be interesting to check this out. Yeah, it is. And it's familiar. It's something that is within the cultural norm of your family. So the question for you is how to see this, that you want to be taken seriously, include that in your stretch zone while still belong to your family and make jokes when it's time to make jokes. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be either or, you know? Yeah. Like now I'm going to be the serious person. I can't make a joke at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a very interesting process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. Anybody else on Zoom? I'm not sure anybody okay. else who made it into a breakout room with a partner. So, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Got it. How about in the room? Not on Zoom, but in the room. Oh, they rhyme. <laughs> um, how is it for you to see this, to talk about this? Yeah. It's an illustration. It's like a, um, you know, uh, you can talk about something, you can think about something abstractly, but when you actually say it, it it's like an illustrate, it's like a, a drawing of, a, mm. of, oh, of course, this makes perfect sense, you know? But it's not like, on some level, you know it, but you don't. Yes. If you don't say it. it yes, you don't know it well if you don't say it. Yeah. If you don't hear your voice saying yeah. these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Jimmy? I found that without having to make reference to what we do. Yes. The specifics about it, that it, 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 it made it, the, the questions being so succinct, put it in my responses in bullet points mm -hmm. so that it um, it had a lot of clarity uh, about what was being expressed rather than a lot of explanation mm -hmm. about it. So it was very succinct. Yeah. Thank you. That's what we want to communicate with clarity and within ourselves. Yeah, anybody else? You can help me notice how much what I'm doing or saying. It helped you notice how much what you're doing or saying. It helped, what I, it helped me notice that what I do and say, how much it affects the other person. I think a lot of times I can be thinking about how I feel in a situation or mm -hmm. what I'm really wanting. And a lot of times I'm wanting more connection and more authentic communication, but then I'm realizing, am I putting out the vibe that that's even on the table? Or right. Am I making the other person feel like they can share openly? And when I do what I do, I'm realizing, no, not at all. Like, of course, I'm getting the outcome that I'm, that I'm getting and that I'm displeased with because I'm not providing that environment. And, yeah. And maybe making them feel even more uncertain or more insecure based off of what I'm, I'm sharing or not sharing. Yeah, thank you. How many of you notice that the what you how you think it impacts the other and the relationship you're not getting what you would like to get you're getting maybe the opposite or what you're getting is not satisfactory yeah okay great sarana did you raise your hand i saw a hand there but i was <laughs> yeah uh for the context um i worked with the feeling um I grew up in a culture where I'm not allowed to like talk back to adults yeah and like the people that have more power than me and so what I do is just avoid suppress and like maybe distance myself mm -hmm. um, so what I realized is that um, like I keep doing that now and uh, I think what I realized was um, I maybe I don't trust that people will have a uh, skill to have a like effective communication with me. Mm. So like if I express it, maybe it'll make things worse. It's right. just going to become even bigger arguments. Yeah. Um, and so, and by not like by doing this, avoiding, um, it just creates more resentment and more distance. And I feel more powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How is it to see all this right now? Um, I kind of knew it, <laughs> but uh, but I I didn't see that. Oh, it's actually like it's not true that like like not everyone like some people do have a skill. Like we can have difficult conversations. Yes. And go through it, but um, it's nice to see that like oh. It's also like my side that I'm not trusting the person will have the skills. You're stretching it already. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, let's hear one more. Kathy. Um, so the process, um, it, 
especially like the question about like the effect on the relationship and on the other person like it helped me to see how my behaviors are really counterproductive mm. and um how when i try to repress um emotions that much of the time especially in close relationships the other person can tell right they already can tell anyway yeah. and so um that yeah recognizing that makes it just kind of seem makes me take a look at at that pattern um from more of a unattached um way and mm -hmm. just be able to see like oh well it's kind of silly almost um this behavior pattern of trying to hide things that yeah it's really actually obvious to other people yeah it's in plain sight for others yeah and you're trying to hide it and cover it mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you so much so i have a big question for you who would like to continue doing what they're doing to get the kind of outcome you're kind of getting do i get any takers <laughs> okay who would yeah Yes. Yeah, sort of sometimes because it feels safer. Aha, uh -huh. it feels it, it, safe. I mean, my experience is that um, it's it's dangerous to do otherwise sometimes. Or let me rephrase, it was dangerous. Aha, uh -huh. yes. When I was younger. And now it's it's sort of this like ineffectual strategy okay that um ha nevertheless that feeling of yeah it's safer to just shut down and shut up right and let's acknowledge that this thank you for bringing that up jimmy because this this fear that it is safer it's actually fear for something that has already happened And you're here right now and you did not die i don't talk to dead people <laughs> yeah you didn't die you're right here full of aliveness and you've more than survived so how is it to notice that the fear is just for a past that already happened it makes me chuckle I mean, it, it's, 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 it makes you chuckle. You know, and, and, and there's that, there's an element of that, of, okay, sort of whistling past the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Let's give him the mic so that we that. make sure that people on Zoom can hear you. So there's a, that element of whistling past the graveyard. I'm sort of going to laugh it off in, in, in order to avoid the, the difficulty. But then there's another element there of, it really is funny to me how easy it is and how frequent it is that I still engage in the same old behavior. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's gotten to the point now where it no longer makes me angry or frustrated. It kind of, it's like, <laughs> You're just kind of silly, man. You yeah. Know? So when you're doing that, you're not a choice. I beg pardon? You're not a choice. You're not choosing. You're just relating, behaving habitually. So you're not being the real you now. You are continuing a past version of yourself. Right. The question is, do you want that? Do you want to continue that? Is that what you choose? Given a choice. Given a choice, no. But in the moment, sometimes right. I know so, I will. Right. Yes. Thank you. So given a choice, most of us do not want to continue doing what we're doing. Yes? Okay. So just 30 seconds. Let's do something for a moment. Can you all look up into the right? So no, notice that I'm not 
moving my head. Can you all look up and to the right? If you want to close your eyes, because that's more comfortable, close your eyes. Keep your eyeballs up and to the right. I can explain this in our next workshop while we're doing this. Now see, imagine a version of you who has already included what was hard for you to communicate today in their stretch zone. So see a version of you there. Imagine that that future version of you is able to communicate what's hard for you now. They are able to communicate it. And now bring your awareness into them and notice what it feels like in their body to be able to communicate skillfully what the you now doesn't yet know how to communicate. How does it feel in their body? Notice what they say to themselves. What is their internal dialogue like? Do they say, I'm going to try this new thing. I'm going to do something different. I actually am able to say X, Y, Z. And now hear their voice saying that. Not what it's in their internal dialogue, but hear their voice saying what's hard for you now to communicate. And then notice that future version of yourself, sort of like looking back at you sitting here at the SF Dharma Collective on September 7th, 2024, and saying to you, thank you. And then as a closing, I'd love to ask you, each of you, to just mention one word of what's present for you right now. And what I would say for myself here is um, possibility. Permission. Permission. Future. Future. Gratitude, confidence, confidence. Curiosity. curiosity, compassion, freedom, clarity, hope. Zoomers. One word of what's present for you. For the people on Zoom. Optimism, and you had one? Optimism, and? I was um, passing the ball to Anne. <laughs> Deep presence. Deep presence. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, some announcements. So the next workshop here is Saturday, October 12th. I think it is. It's October. I think, yeah, I think that's what it is. Saturday, October 12th. And I'm quickly checking here. Uh, yes, it's Saturday, October 12th. Same time, 10 to 12. Um, I also have some announcement here that... Um, if you want to join my newsletter and get weekly communication tools right into your inbox, you can. There's a QR code here. I have a course coming up, which is an eight-week online course. It's called Choosing True Connection, and it's how to have these conversations with specifically with people who have another idea of the world than us. And it's going to start right. I want to prepare people right before before the holidays because we're going to. It's going to be after the elections, and how do we talk to family? How do we talk to people and have a true sense of connection? So that's November 10th to January 5th. 
there's a, a QR code here if you're interested. I also have a group coaching programs and the next one will be in February of 2025. This is only available for 10 people. Some of you here have been in that uh, pr program. You can be in the next program. And, uh, and then you have my podcast, uh, which is like 15 minute communication um, mini workshops that you can take. So you have all the QR codes here. Thank you so much. Um, I so appreciate your willingness to explore how to bring more awareness, more love, more peace, more equity to this world that really needs us to show up in those ways. Thank you.